Hey, Tyson here from Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee. Thank you for listening to our message today. Refuge Church is a family of faith sent to proclaim hope in Jesus Christ through relationships. For more resources and information about Refuge, please visit us on the web at refugeph.com. All right, y'all can be seated. We're going to be in Luke chapter 2 today, uh, jump around just a little bit. But I think we learned something today. All the kids are saying, I'm never going up there again, <laughs> because they will remember that. Second thing we learned is, if you fall, the church will help pick you up. <laughs> so this might be the most watched sermon on YouTube, not because the sermon, but uh, anyway, I'd like to see that on video, maybe. All right, we are talking about uh, Christmas this morning. I've titled this message, A Savior Was Born for You. Um, and and I, want this, I want to offer you some hope today. That's really why we exist as a church, is to offer hope. And, and I couldn't help but think about this. Uh, Shelly and I were sitting there last night, and I was asking her about uh, the Charlie Brown Christmas. If, you, if you're like my age and older, you've probably for sure seen uh, the Charlie Brown Christmas. I encourage all people to watch it. It's back when TV was sort of wholesome and, and good. And Charles Schultz, who, who wrote that whole thing, was a Christian. And he um, said, I'll do that, but you have to let me share the gospel in in that cartoon, and he did. If you remember uh, what happened is Charlie Brown brings his little Christmas tree in there, and it's sort of ugly looking, and they make fun of him, and they're all laughing, and, and he yells, and he goes, I wish somebody would just tell me what Christmas is all about. And do you remember who told him what Christmas was all about? Linus, right? And if you're not paying attention, here's the thing about Linus, is if you follow uh, Linus through the movie, he's always carrying what? He's carrying his blanket, right? He's got his little comfort blanket. He's, it's like he's scared. He's got this fear, and that's his comfort. But do you know what happens when he shares the gospel? He puts his blanket down. For that brief moment, he puts his blanket down because his hope was not in some blanket that was going to provide him safety or comfort or whatever it is. It was the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to give you today. In this world that maybe we've got things that we're fearful of, maybe we're sad about. You know, Christmas is a time that's supposed to be joyful. But, you know, if you've lost a loved one, it can be a time of sadness. It, it can be a time of sadness for many reasons. Um, not, not everyone is always happy at Christmas. But I, but I want for just a moment for us to just think about Linus in that moment. And I want us... To talk about Jesus so that we can put our comforts down. Whatever your comfort is that you run to, that we can put that down when we begin to see what Jesus Christ did for us and why he came as a baby. The, the word hope, it means joyful and confident expectation of eternal salvation. I want to read the verse for you, Luke chapter 10, or Luke chapter 2, verse 10. I'll finish with this verse as well. But it says, uh, he's talking to the angels. Remember, they had seen that star that Martin had talked about, the Bethlehem star. It says, But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. All people. And he says, Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you. you who is the Messiah, the Lord. What I want you to leave here today is to understand that when we talk about Jesus, and we talk about Christmas, and we talk about the cross... It is for you personally that Jesus Christ died for you. So that's where we're going to be. Now, I want to go back and I want to look at the beginning of the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 1 because there's a couple of things that I want to pull out of the story. Uh, Rodney's going to read the Christmas story tonight uh, at the uh, Christmas Eve service. So you're going to hear the whole thing. But I just want to pull out just a couple of pieces that point us to Jesus. They go back to the Old Testament and then we're going to come back to Jesus but I want you to see this. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. It says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. This first registration took place while Quirinius was governor, governing Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and of the family line of David. 
That's a prophecy that is fulfilled. I don't have time to chase that. But Mary and, and Joseph were from the line of David. Jesus from the line of David. Anyway, verse 5. It says, To be registered along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. Then she gave birth to her firstborn son. Now that's important. If you, if you understand the Old Testament, there's a whole lot of references to the firstborn. Matter of fact, the firstborn gets two-thirds of the inheritance. If there's two sons, the, the first son gets double portion. I'm going to explain just a little bit of that here in just a minute. And, and that was meant for a reason, and I'll show you that. It says, But she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in a cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So, first of all, I want to say this. Jesus is Mary's firstborn son, but he was not created right here. The Bible tells us in John chapter 1 that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That everything was created through him, and without him not anything was made. Jesus was present at creation. He is not a created being. This is when Jesus came to earth in the flesh, is what it's talking about here in, uh, in Luke chapter 2. Uh, Matthew chapter 1 verse 20 says this. It says, But after he had considered these things... An angel of the Lord appeared to him, this is to Joseph, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. You know the word, the, the name Jesus literally means he will save. That's what it means. So the, what, what God or the angel is telling Joseph in this moment that this son that your uh, future wife is about to have will save the world from their sins. I don't want us to lose sight of that at Christmas. That, that that's the ultimate purpose. That if Jesus came to be born in a miraculous way and he didn't die for our sins, it means nothing to us. That the ultimate reason that Jesus came was to die for our sins and to save us from our sins. It says in verse 22, Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. It says, See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will uh, name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. That's an that's a Isaiah chapter 7 reference. God with us. That's what happened at his birth, is that God literally came down to be with us. And we think, right, we think, man, that would be awesome if we got to see Jesus today. But do you know that we have something better than that? Because Jesus, when he was here on earth, he could only be in one place at one time. That now, this side of the resurrection that we are on, we get God in us. Like we're better off than they were. That's why Jesus said, it's better that I leave you because I'm going to send you a helper. All of us who are Christians, we get a helper. God puts his spirit inside of us. So what we have today is better than the news that they were getting in this moment. John chapter 1 verse 14 says this. It says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's what Christmas is about. God became flesh and He dwelt among us. The word dwelt literally means tabernacled. He pitched His tent with us. He wanted to be with us. It says, We observed His glory, the glory of the one and only, only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. He's full of grace and he's full of truth. Verse 16 says that we have received all grace upon grace from his fullness. He's got more grace than we need. Like I don't know how much grace you need in your life, but he has enough. He's full of it. And then it says, for the law was given through Moses, but grace, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is at the Father's side, he has revealed him. So Jesus came to this earth to live a perfect life and to show us what God is like. So if Jesus is full of grace, you know what that means God is like? He's full of grace. You don't believe it? Go back and read the Old Testament. It's literally about God showing his people grace time and time and time again when they turn from him. So now let's go back to Luke chapter 10, or Luke chapter 2. He says, uh, he said, I proclaim to you uh, good news of great joy that will be for all people. That's Luke 2.10. A Savior to, is born to you who is the Messiah, who is the Lord. So here's what I want us to understand. 
He is the Savior. He is full of grace. He is for all people. So here we have this declaration about who Jesus is and why he's come. And then uh, what Mary and Joseph do is they want to follow the law. The Jews had this law that said after so many days of purification, you're to take and dedicate your firstborn son. I'll show you why that's important here in just a moment. So let's look at that. Luke chapter 2 verse 21. It says, when the eight days were completed for his circumcision, he was, uh, he was named Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived. It says, and when the days of their purification, according to the law of Moses, were finished, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. So that's about 40 days. So he's about 50 days old here, roughly. They take him to the temple to dedicate him, as the law requires. It's to present him to the Lord. It's an offering Here, God, he's he's yours. Now, I want you to think about that for a moment because he is God. And Mary and Joseph are giving him back to him. He's yours. God, do with him what you want. Verse 23, just as is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male must be dedicated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is stated to the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves, or two young pigeons. Now here's what the law says. If you go back and you look. It's in uh, Exodus. He kind of talks about it there after the Passover. But it's basically this. The, the firstborn that, that you have. You give back to the Lord. But instead of giving it back to the Lord fully. You offer a sacrifice in its place. You're going to say. Okay God. I'm going I'm to give my child back to you. But I'm, I'm going to offer an alternative, a sacrifice. It's usually a lamb or something like that. The fact that this is turtle doves or pigeons shows that Mary and Joseph were not well off. And, and they offer that as a substitute. And, and, and here's where this goes back to. You're like, well, that's kind of weird. But, but here's where this goes back to. It goes back to Genesis. God called a man Abraham and he said, Abraham, I want to take you from the place you're at and I want to take you to a place that I will show you. And then Abraham comes back and says, you know what? God, like I have no offspring. Like how, how am I going to become a great nation and I have no children? I'm, we're past the age of being able to bear children. And God takes him outside and he says, I want you to look at the stars. He says, how many ever stars you count? That's how your offspring will be. And you know what the Bible says? It's a great statement. It's kind of a game changer in the Bible. It says he believed in God and it was counted to him as righteousness. It was a statement of faith, of salvation for Abraham because he took God at his word without actually seeing it with his own eyes. He took God at his word and it, was, it counted as him as righteousness. Well, it took God some time to answer that prayer. It didn't just happen. Matter of fact, uh, Abraham and Sarah got impatient, did some Jerry Springer stuff, and uh, it wasn't great, right? But, but then God answers the, the prayer, And he provides them with a son, and his name is Isaac. And then you're like, okay, great. God has answered this prayer. Like This this child is literally from God. He's God-given. And then God tells Abraham, he says, Hey, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, and I want you to take him and sacrifice him. What? So Abraham does it. He, He gets his son, and they go out. And they go to Mount Moriah. By the way, that's Mount Moriah is where the Temple Mount is today. This, is, this all happened right there. And he's with his servants. And he says to his servants, I'll read this verse to you. It's Genesis chapter 22 verse 5. Because I think this is important. Abraham said to his young men, he had some servants with him. He said, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there to worship. And then we'll come back to you. You know what Abraham understands in this moment? He says, I know what God's asked me to do, but I know that there's some way that me and the boy are coming back. I don't know if God's going to resurrect him. I don't know if God's going to provide a substitute. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to trust God. And he takes his son up on the mountain, and he gets ready to to kill him, to offer him as a sacrifice, to give him back to God. And God says, oh, I've provided a substitute. I see that you're not willing to withhold your son. Now, here's the idea. God says, I gave you this son. I want you to give him back. 
And Abraham was willing to give him back. But instead of taking him, he took a substitute. You know why? Because he said, I want Isaac to honor me with his life, not his death. He's going to serve me with his life, not his death. He's going to become a living sacrifice. If, if you know the Bible, you know where we're going to go here in just a moment. But, but this is the idea, is that, God, you've given this to me. I want to give it back to you. The idea of a firstborn is similar to the word firstfruits. You'll see the firstfruits in the Bible a lot when it talks about giving. That we give out of our firstfruits. And here's the idea behind that. In, in those times, if you had a crop, let's say you grew corn. I mean, they, I don't know if they grow corn in Israel, but we grow corn here. Let's say you grow corn. And uh, you're trusting God for the crop. You plant it. You, you pray for rain. It rains. The crop begins to come up, and you give God the very first bit of crops that come up. And you know what you're saying by that? You're saying, God, I trust you for the rest of it. Instead of waiting until the crop is completely done, and then you've got some left over and saying, Hey, God, I got this left over here. Do you want this? Do you see the difference? The difference is, I'm going to give you what's first because I'm trusting you for what's to come second. When we give God our first, we're also giving Him our second. He knows if we'll give Him our first, He knows we'll give Him the second. That's the idea. So the firstborn becomes important. Now, you're like, okay, well, that's, that's kind of interesting. Since my brother and mom here, I'm going to kind of break this down because I think it's important about the two-thirds, one-third of, of the uh, inheritance. So I want to break this down. Okay. The idea was that Isaac was the firstborn. But do you know that after that, it sort of got off the rails? Jacob and Esau, who was first? Esau, who did God bless? Jacob. I mean, he deceived him, but whatever. Joseph. You get down in Genesis. Joseph was not the first. Who did God bless? Jesus is from the line of Judah. Judah's not the first. See, because he offered the first, it's like he offered them all. So I'm just throwing it out there, Mom. If you want to come back and YouTube this later, you can. It's great. Uh, anyway, but here's the idea about this whole thing in Genesis. Is that God provided a replacement for Isaac. And it points us to something that's going on here. Now let's go back to uh, Luke chapter 2. It says, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, just as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord. So they're offering Jesus, who is God, back to God. And they offered a substitute in its place. So that Jesus could honor God with his life. Which is exactly what he did. But you know what else Jesus did? He also offered his life as a sacrifice at the end for you and I. See, all that stuff that happens in, in the Old Testament points us to Jesus. It, there's also a passage in the Passover that talks about the firstborn and all these things and why it's important. And I didn't cover that for the sake of time. But all that stuff points us to this moment when they dedicate Jesus to the Lord and say he's yours, not just in his life, but in his death. And they both have a purpose. That he's going to live a perfect life and be the sacrifice for us. That he's going to be a living sacrifice and a dying sacrifice for us. He fulfills all of that in him. And, and, and the question is, what does that mean for us? At Christmas. Like here's what I, th I think I want us to, to get out of this passage. I want us, I want us to be challenged as Christians. I, I want us to leave here with hope and I want us to be challenged. And, and I think here's the challenge for us. Is that we do baby dedications here and we dedicate the baby to the Lord. We're really dedicating the family to the Lord. Maybe we should rethink how we do that, thinking about this passage. I've been thinking about changing that. But, but I want you to think about this. If we, we offer our baby to the Lord and say, God, he's yours. But I, but I have a question for you. You probably don't remember your baby dedication, if you were. And if you weren't, 
That's fine. My question is, as a Christian, have you offered God your life today? Have you said, God, here's my life. Take it. It's yours. I told you that if you, 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 you've heard about the living sacrifice, it made you think about a passage. That passage is Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Here's what I want you to think about this Christmas is, am, am I giving back to God what I owe Him? Am I worshiping Him with my life? Romans 12, 1 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, mercy means not getting what we deserve, I urge you to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. More so than singing songs, more so than even putting money in an offering plate, the greatest act of worship that we can give God is to live a life that is holy and pleasing to Him. That's what it means to worship Him. And that's my challenge for us as Christians. Is are we doing that with our lives? Have we offered it back to Him? Are we living a life of a living sacrifice? And my second challenge is for maybe those here who don't, have never put their faith and trust in Jesus. If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, we, we talk a lot about Christmas and we talk a lot about this word peace. That it... That, that Jesus came to give us peace. Can I, can I tell you something if you've never put your faith and hope in Jesus? Is that you're not at peace with God. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us that you're, you're hostile to God. And you say, well, that's, that's kind of weird. I don't hate God. But you've rejected His Son. He, he's offered His Son as a free gift on the cross for you. And you've said, no, nah, I'm good i got to be honest with you. If you have a problem with my son, you're probably going to have a problem with me. Sound big up here, Donna, right? <laughs> we won't have a problem. I'll go get my boys, but whatever. But that's the idea. I want you to think about this, that if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, you're hostile to God. You're, you're an enemy. You're not at peace with God. So I, I, I love this passage in Colossians because it brings all of these things that we've talked about together. And then it's going to offer us some hope beyond just today. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. Here's what it says. It says, He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. You know why He loves us? Because of His Son. And because his son said, he's mine. Because we've put our faith and trust in him. Verse 14. In him we have redemption. What does it mean to be redeemed? It means to be bought and paid for. That, that when, when uh, in the Old Testament, when Isaac was offered and the ram was given in its place, it was redeemed. It was paid for. We've been paid for by what Jesus Christ did for us. And it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by Him in heaven and on earth, the visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and by Him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. So that he might come to have first place in everything. Now let me explain something here. He's the firstborn. He was offered back to, uh, to God and they provided a substitute. Then ultimately at the end of his life, his life was offered in our place. He's the firstborn, but he's also the firstborn from the dead. What does that mean? He rose again. He's the first to, in his own power to rise again. And you know what? When we talked about the first fruits, you know what the first fruits are about? It's the promise that there's more to come. Well, he's the firstborn of the dead. Why? Because it's a promise that there's more to come. And you know who that is? Those of us who put our faith and trust in Jesus. We're those who will follow the firstborn from the dead. So that he might come f uh, to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace 
through his blood shed on the cross. We come here, we talk about Christmas, we talk about a baby, but it ultimately ends at the cross. It's that blood that he shed on the cross that makes peace for us. It's not because you think you're good enough. It's not because you go to church. It's not because you haven't said any cuss words in 12 days. It's not because of whatever you think it is that God should love you. It's only because of the blood of Jesus Christ. It makes peace with God. And either we put our faith and trust in Him or we don't. It says, making peace through His blood shed on the cross... Once you were alienated and hostile in your minds as expressed in your evil actions. When we reject God, we're saying, God, I'm going to do it my way and hope it works out for the best. That's what we're saying. God, I don't need your son. i got a pretty good handle on things down here myself. We're alienated and hostile. Verse 22. But now he has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, thoughtless, And blameless before him. Now here's what makes the birth of Jesus so important. It's that he lived the holy, faultless, uh, and blameless life. So that when he died on the cross, he took our sin and we put on his righteousness. Can I tell you for a guy who's not righteous, which is me, that is great news. That when God looks at me, he doesn't see my lack of righteousness. He sees Jesus Christ. I put on his righteousness. And he took on my sin. Verse 23. If indeed you remain grounded, steadfast in the faith, and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. So here's the idea. I'm going to ask TC and Danielle to come up here and the band. And As we think about Christmas, here's what I want us to think about. There's hope provided to us through the gospel. Hope that we can be found righteous through Jesus and that he takes on our sins and that we get a relationship with him. We get life now with him and life eternal. So so here's my, I said I was going to give you a choice today or offer you some hope. For the Christian, here's my challenge or my choice for you. Would you be willing to offer your life As a living sacrifice to God. God, after all you've done for me. God, here's my life. Do with it what you want. It's the greatest act of worship that we could do. And there's no better time to do that than at Christmas. Second of all, if you're here and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, you have a choice. You can remain hostile to God, not at peace with God, but hostile to God. Or you can put your faith and trust in Him, take on His righteousness and give your sin to Him. Or you can stand before Him one day in your sin and say, here I am. And He's going to say, I never knew you. That's the choices that are laid out for us today. This Christmas, what I want to do is I want to leave you with Luke chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. This is the claim that was made to the angels. It says, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all people. That's for everybody in this room. It's for your neighbor. It's for your friends and family you're about to eat with. It's for everybody that you come in contact with. Good news and great joy that as we celebrate Christmas today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you there's nobody too far gone that Jesus can't save them there's nobody too far away that Jesus can't save them he's for you he's the Messiah and he's the Lord would you pray with me thank you for listening to this message today brought to you by Refuge Church please visit our website for more resources as well as our YouTube channel just search for Refuge Church in Lenore City, Tennessee to find us We hope that this message has helped you find hope in Jesus Christ.